we're on Habakkuk this Sunday, and one of the difficulties of uh, the daily Bible reading schedule is that from week to week, we might be on a different book. And uh, this is one of those books where it's tough to just kind of just land somewhere in the middle. So what I want to do with Habakkuk is point out what I think is uh, the pivotal verse uh, in the entire book of Habakkuk and use that to try to explain what Habakkuk is essentially saying for three chapters that he writes. So Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4, it's only one verse, but we'll uh, be hanging on to that while referencing some other verses throughout Habakkuk as we uh, go in on our meditation today. This is God's word. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. You know, let me pray for us, and then we'll uh, begin our time after. <laughs> our Father, we thank you for uh, giving us uh, this time where we get to meet you through your word. We praise you because you are a God who is faithful to us in the midst of all of our infidelity. We ask you this morning that you would remind us that the gospel is not circumstantial. It does not depend upon our surrounding situations, but our, your gospel is forever and everlasting, uh, that even in heaven we will be singing about the praises of how you rescued us from our sin. Uh, so may that grip our hearts this morning as you speak tenderly into our hearts, and we pray that you would unbond all our affections together in Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. I want to try to do this in as quick a way as possible, uh, summarizing a little bit of what Habakkuk is. You know, in my, the first time I ever watched a 3D movie was about four years ago. That's the only time I ever watched it. So the only time I ever watched a 3D movie was in a theater, and I had to put on glasses, right? You put on 3D glasses to look at what the movie is uh, tr trying to be so impressive about from all the effects and all that. You take the glasses off, and there's a bunch of little pink spots everywhere. Well, at least that's what I saw. I don't know how it's developed since then. And it's a very imperfect uh, but for me, for me, it makes sense as to why, uh, as to how we can understand Habakkuk through this very verse here. These, uh, this is our 3D glasses, Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, because it's the only place in the entire book where the word faith is used. There's no other portion in Habakkuk where faith is used. But I think that's the most important thing about the entire book of Habakkuk, the fact that people shall live by faith. And we'll talk about what that means uh, more as we unpack the message a little further. But it's because we look at the world through lens of faith. We're Christian people, and we have a different hope and glory uh, that we're striving for. So we look at this world from a different perspective, and we see it in a different angle. And that's essentially what Habakkuk is trying to teach us this morning. Where he's trying to teach us that in the midst of all of our circumstances and situations, the gospel teaches us to look at the world from a certain perspective and always have hope in the midst of everything that we're going through. You know, it reminds me of a famous C.S. Lewis statement about his belief in God, that he believes in him like he believes in the sun, not because he can see him, but by him he can see everything else in creation, right? And that's kind of how uh, we want to envision Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 this morning, that through the lens of faith, we're able to see God and what he's doing in all of creation, especially in the redemption of our souls. So three points, uh, three things in relation to our faith, and three R's to help us remember a little better. Uh, the first is the reason for our faith. The second is the reality of our faith. And the third is the root of our faith. So first we look at the reason for our faith. If you can skip over to Hebrews. Hebrews is near the end of the near the end of the Bible. But in Hebrews chapter 11, we have a famous prelude to what, uh, to Old Testament accounts of what faith might be. And these are Old Testament figures who want to testify that there's something in the future, something they can't see that is better than all the things that the Jewish people are holding on to. And before that, the author of Hebrews write in verse one, writes in verse 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. So we just mentioned right now that this is a testimony of Old Testament figures who are saying, you know, there's something better coming in the future. You know, we have our sacrificial system. We have this tabernacle and this tent, but there's something better happening in the future. And I want to testify about this thing that I cannot see. 
Uh, this is the context of Hebrews, but faith is actually everywhere around us in this world. You know, for some reason or another, faith is attributed solely to religion. Uh, but it's not like that. Faith is everywhere. It's not just in religion. It's in our daily conduct. You know, when we stepped outside this morning or we, when we woke up this morning, we had to have faith in the laws of gravity in order to be able to walk properly in the proper static and kinetic friction underneath our feet. You know, you have to have faith that your gears would turn when you turn on your car. Uh, you have to have faith that someone will be preaching here this morning well, when you come to Jubilee. That everything is built upon trust, and you have to have faith in something outside of yourself in, in order for this world to operate, and in order for you to have peace with the things and the way this world operates. And Habakkuk talks exactly about that in chapter 2, verse 4. He's saying there are two ways you can have faith. You can have faith by being puffed up, or you can have faith by being righteous. There are two different ways where you can have faith. And I want to turn our attention to the first one for now. In the first portion of uh, this verse, we read, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. That word puffed up is the Hebrew word that is most like bodily swelling. So the picture we get is someone who intakes so much in order to enlarge in himself or herself. Right? So this is bodily swelling, this, this puffed up imagery. And the way Habakkuk liken, likens this definition is what we see in chapter 1, verse 11. There we, uh, Habakkuk says, Then they sweep by like, the, by like the wind and go on, guilty men whose own might is their God. So Habakkuk is saying here, the way they're puffing themselves up, the way they're trusting is that they're building their might and their strength so much that they can, they can depend upon themselves and they can essentially be their own God. That's their belief system. And that's what Habakkuk's pointing towards. You know, if you look right after our passage in chapter 2, verse 4, and look at verses 6 and 9, uh, starting in verse 6 in chapter 2, we get the five woes that God pronounces upon the Chaldeans. And the first two relate to how they're puffing themselves up. They are building their own might and trying to strengthen themselves. In chapter 2, verse 6, it says, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. Right, so... Uh, these people are building their kingdom by taking things that are not their own. They're conquering other nations, neighboring people, and they're taking what's not their own in order to enlarge in themselves. And then in verse 9, we have, Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to, to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. So they're building themselves so high to protect themselves from any kind of harm, any threats of their might and their strength being taken from them because this is essential for them, that they can be self-sustaining. They can be this gigantic figure in history that conquers other nations and that all people have to fear. This is the Chaldeans, better known as the Babylonians, that Habakkuk talks about, and that eventually does conquer the southern kingdom, uh, the kingdom of Judah, in coming days after. You know, uh, before going to how this applies to us, uh, I was reminded this week of a story of, it's, it's an actual event, of, of a Holocaust survivor uh, going face to face with Adolf Eichmann, who was responsible for the deaths of many, many during that time. And he was on trial, and the survivor was coming down, to, uh, coming down and he looked at Adolf Eichmann, and he just started crying. He started weeping. And uh, he was interviewed after. He's like, why, why, why are you weeping so much? What's, uh, what's going on? Was it because you were afraid? Uh, is it because you uh, were thinking about all the tragedies that incurred? Or was it because you lost loved ones during the process? And this man looks at the interviewer and he says, no, it's because I looked at him and I realized that he is just a man. That he was capable of so much evil, but he was just a man. And I realized that that could have easily been me. So when we think about the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, often we have a tendency to look at these people as, oh, these are, these are other kinds of people. You know, these are people who are so capable of evil, but I can't even uh, touch upon their kind of evil. But before we do that, I want to I wanna, I wanna remind ourselves that we are just as sinful. You know, we, have just as, uh, we, have, we are just as prone to slip and fall into sinful ways. It might not seem like that in the eyes of other people in this world, but we're just as wicked. We're just as evil. And we need the protection of Jesus to sanctify us. We need the protection of Jesus and his law to, to guide us in, the, in a better way. 
And that's one thing I want to throw out there before looking at some of the wicked deeds of the Babylonians, is that we were enemies of God. We were those who spit in the face of God. We're self-seeking people. And as we think about the Chaldeans and some of their woes, um, those are some reflections that I had before. So I thought about, you know, what, uh, what's, what are some ways that this would apply to us today? You know, what are some ways where understanding the Bal- Babylonians and Chaldeans might apply to us? And I said, you know, why not ask Jesus? Why not ask Jesus what he thinks? And, uh, you know, in the entirety of his ministry, Jesus talked more about money than anything else. And if he talked this much about money today, he wouldn't have a church, right? But he talked so much about money and how wicked it was for people to hoard their money. And I think he does that because understanding money has a direct correlation to how we understand salvation. How we understand money, how we perceive money, how we depend upon money, and what that does for us is correlated to how we understand our salvation in Jesus Christ. A couple things about that uh, to kind of press upon our hearts how we Often, uh, we follow this uh, puffed up nature, you know, trusting in our own nature, our own might kind of nature in the way that we have our faith in ourselves. Is money makes us greedy. That's one thing that it does amongst other things. You know, there are a list of things that money might do for us. But money makes us greedy. And, you know, I have uh, these core meetings or uh, leadership meetings that I, um, I, I conduct here and there. Um, I've done it since San Diego, and I've always asked similar questions. Uh, they're, they're not always the exact same, but uh, right now the spiritual vitals that I ask are five questions. Right? Uh, how is God talking to you this week? How are you talking to God? Um, how, how are people talking to you, and how are you talking to people? And lastly, how is Satan talking to you? And the fifth question is always when the confession of sin comes up, right? You know, this is the ways that I've been provoked this week to know that I'm sinful and I'm in need of the gospel. No one ever, at least in my memory, no one has ever said, I'm greedy. Because none of us think we're greedy. Because greed is kind of a comparative sin. You know, the less you have, you, you look at other people like, oh, but they have more than I do, so I, I can't be greedy. The more you have, you look at the people who have less, and you say, well, but I give more than they do, so I'm more generous than they are. So I'm not greedy. You know, it's a comparative sin. But the nature of greed is the fact that we're not content with what we have. And we've talked about this with coveting and how that's breaking the 10th commandment and essentially the first commandment. But greed shows us that because of our longing and our desire for natural and created things, we're not content and satisfied with what already consumes us or what already has us in our hearts. Because money, like anything else in this world, is fleeting. And because of that, uh, we will never be content, um, sufficiently content with the things that it provides. It shows us that we're not comp- content. But the second thing greed shows us is that we want to be self-sustaining. And the desire to be self-sustaining is by looking for created things in this world to sustain us while a creator is waiting to sustain us with, for all of our affections, our needs, our commitment, our trust, all these things that only the God of this universe can do. We're, we're looking for created things to do that for us. And that's what money does. It might not just be money for us. It might be a list of other things. You know, we might struggle with, uh, we might struggle with different areas of self-esteem. Maybe it's perception, how people view us, or our social standing. You know, according to Jesus, these are all things that are related to money during that time. But these are ways where we want to stand above other people. And we want to feel good about the way that we trust in ourselves and have faith in ourselves. But this is the way that we see the Babylonians running with. Trusting in their own might. Trusting to, to know that they don't need a God of this universe to make themselves happy. They can create their own belief system, and they can function just like they want to. And the question I have uh, before we move on to our next point, our our next topic is, are we like that in some measure? Because all of us have a tendency to slip in that first line of thinking, the puffed up nature of how we we imagine ourselves. How are we like that? And if if we're like that in any way, how can we ask for prayer? How can we ask for God to change our hearts so we do not become like that? And I, I think that happens in a multitude of ways, by God speaking to us and also other people speaking to our, into our lives, into thinking, you know, how, does the, how can the gospel better us in trusting our Savior, not other created means? 
You know, the second line of thinking is the righteous shall live by his faith. And this is, uh, this is probably the section that we like a little better, right? The righteous shall live by his faith. Uh, there's a famous verse by the Apostle Paul, Reformed people love quoting it because it captures so well the doctrine of justification. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, you know, for our sake he made him who knew no sin to become sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Right? It's, a, it's a swapping, the great exchange language that people love so much. But if you look at that passage, Jesus doesn't become sin, right? If we are Bible-believing folks and we track the life of Jesus Christ, he doesn't become a sinner. And when he's on the cross, he, uh, he's not dying for his own sin. He's becoming, uh, him becoming sin is a father gazing upon that cross and envisioning that very thing he hates the most. And that's what Jesus becomes in the view of his father. It's a status change. He, he changes according to status from being righteous to guilty in order to transfer that righteousness to us. So that when God views us in the midst of all of our sin, because we continue to sin, just because we become a Christian doesn't mean we don't sin anymore. We'll sin until the day we die. But in the views of our Lord, we are not viewed as sinful or as guilty. We're viewed as perfect, blameless, and spotless because Jesus gives us that privilege. He switches places with us. That's the, that's the status change that propels us to live by this faith. Live according to the faith of the gospel. Because we are righteous. We don't, have to, we don't have to fear the worst of outcomes in the history of this universe. Because we are righteous. And God is on our side. There's a book by David Brooks, who's a, a New York Times bestseller. Uh, he, he's also a journalist. Uh, called The Road to Character. And in that book, he talks about a, something called sin. That's something we're all fam familiar with. But he says today in our modern day, we have, a, we have a tendency to remove sin from the personal and put it into the corporate. So we, we have a tendency to say sin isn't a personal thing, uh, but it's, in, it's the institutions, the organizations, the uh, uh, different policies that are placed above us. Those are the things, the authorities, those are the things that are wicked and wrong with this world and not ourselves. The thing, the thing that is wrong is the things that are above us, not, not our own heart. About 100 years before David Brooks wrote his book, uh, the world was going through its first world war. Well, not the world, but people, might, people in the world might have thought that it was the world. Uh, but the British Times during that time inquired some authors about, uh, some best-selling authors according to their day, about this very question, what is wrong with this world? And G.K. Chesterton, who is an influence to C.S. Lewis, and he was once a, uh, once a Roman Catholic, and he became a Catholic, and became a Christian after. And he answered this in a very witty way that captured my heart, and I still remember it to this day, where he, wrote, he writes, Dear Sirs, in regards to your question, I am. Here is truly G.K. Chesterton. So he admits to uh, the times that the problem with this world is the self. You know, we're, we're the problem with what's going on in this universe. We're the problem with this sinful world. And this is a sentiment that a lot of people don't really capture, especially even in the church of Jesus Christ. We don't believe truly that we're the problem. And because of that, we often think that we have a solution because we don't think we're the problem. But the only way, the only way we can understand this righteousness, the way we become righteous to live by faith, is understanding that we're the problem and that we need help. We're in severe need of help. I was debating whether I should share this or not, but I, I will. And uh, uh, when, I'm, I'm a young guy, but I've been in ministry for about six years, or I've been dependent upon, financially dependent upon ministry for about six years. And one of the uh, benefits that, of that is you really get to trust in the Lord for your, uh, for your stability. But one of the drawbacks is that you, have to, you really have to live month to month sometimes. And there are some months where, uh, I remember it would, it would be like the 10th of the month, right? So you have like three weeks left, and I'm checking my bank account. I was like, how am I at like $40? This makes no sense. And I'm, I'm panicking, and I'm thinking, you know, there's no way I'm going to make it through this month because, you know, you're starting to pump like $6.21 into the gas station, and you have 
different ways you have to compensate for your lack of wealth, but you just need help, right? And the reason I bring up this issue is not so you can pity me, you know, or not so that you can feel sorry for me, but I remember that exact feeling of fe feeling so helpless where I couldn't generate any income out of my own to s sustain myself for the remaining three weeks, feeling so helpless and needy in uh, need of help from other people. Often that help was called Visa credit card, but, you know, uh, just for the sake of example, f forget that that was there. But, you know, we, uh, we, we have to be in that position where we feel like we are spiritually and utterly bankrupt, where we feel like we can't offer anybody anything, and we are in need to survive, and we are in need for help every day of our life. You know, when often Christians, when uh, we walk around, uh, you know, I think one of the reasons why this world hates Christians so much is because we turn Christianity almost into a subculture, right? Well, we feel like everything that we're doing is right and everything the world, doing is wrong, world is doing is wrong. Uh, we feel like we have everything together and other people are just projects. They're projects that we have to fix. Uh, they're, they're people that have issues, unlike us, because we never have issues, right? You know, they're projects that we have to fix. And because of that mindset, a lot of times people have a very negative perception of Christianity, when Christianity becomes a subculture of sorts. But, you know, um, brothers and sisters, from, from beggar to beggar, you know, we need help. And it's not just we need help in a confession, but it's that we need help in our posture. We need help from our Heavenly Father. We need help from the Savior who came to empty everything that he has to fill our bank accounts, to sustain us to supply us with hope in the midst of our tragedies, we need help. And unless we assume this posture before our Heavenly Father and also before other people, we will never understand what it means that the righteous shall live by his faith. We're just using spiritual language and spiritual things to puff ourselves up and use our own might. But we need help, and that's uh, what leads us into our second point, the reality of our faith. Because that's a tough place to be. Always feeling like you need help. Always feeling like you need someone to sustain you for something. That's a tough place to be. You know, when one of the depressing things about the entire book of Habakkuk is that usually in prophetic books, there, um, there's a reference to the prophet asking Israel or Judah to confess their sins. You know, turn back from your evil ways and confess your sins so judgment won't be upon you. You know, turn back so that you don't have to face the consequences of all this wickedness that you're incurring upon yourself. Turn back. Repent before the Lord. But there's no call for repentance here in Habakkuk. You know, if anything, Habakkuk is trying to tell Judah at this time, live by faith. These things will happen to you. But live by faith. How will you do that? Will you do that just like the Babylonians and Chaldeans who are puffing themselves up using their own might? Or are you going to trust in the God of your salvation, the God who is your strength? Er Ernie Johnson, who is a TNT broadcaster, you know, many of us probably saw this two and a half minute YouTube video already. Or if you were, maybe you saw it live on TNT. But he, uh, he's on a halftime NBA show. But he was reflecting upon the recent presidential election. And he was talking about um, some of the things that he uh, wanted to confess in terms of, you know, how, how bitter he was about certain things, but also what he was hopeful for. And he, he says a lot of good things, but I just want to highlight one thing because I really feel like it captures what I want to say in the second point. As he, he says from one election to the next, he doesn't know who will be in the Oval Office, but he always knows who's on the throne. Because Ernie Johnson is a Christian. And he has faith not, on, uh, not upon the, the civil authorities above us, but the ultimate person that he responds to and he answers to is our Father in heaven, the Lord of all creation, Jesus the Savior who comes to be with us, who has a power to undo death, to overturn death. He says, that's who I answer to. And that's, um, that's what I want to focus on here in our second point, is that our faith and our, the faith we have in Jesus Christ is never circumstantial. You know, the present things in this world can never change the gospel. The things that we struggle with and we have hardships with, that can't change our understanding of the gospel. 
If anything, it should strengthen our understanding of the gospel because the power of the gospel is not contingent upon the things in this world. It's vice versa. In, in spite of the things in this world, the, the gospel is still good to us. Even more so, it's better for us. And, you know, when uh, we, look at some of, we, we look at some of the ways where uh, we try to find contentment, satisfaction, sustenance. You know, a lot of times it's not the way that Habakkuk encourages us to. If we turn to the end of the, end, the, end of the book in Habakkuk 3, verses 17 and 19 are almost words that seem too unrealistic for us. It seems too unrealistic for me a lot of times. But uh, this is what Habakkuk writes, starting in verse 17. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. You know, um, those four things are the basic necessities of life. And Habakkuk is saying, even if those things aren't there, right, in the next two, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. These are possessions, identity markers, status markers. And this is a people that will eventually, in about 20 years, or maybe about 40 years from uh, from this point when Habakkuk is writing this book, you know, they'll, uh, they'll be nationless. They won't be able to be called Israelites at that point because they won't have a nation at that point. You know, the Babylonians strike three times, you know, first in 609 and then last in 586. And those three times that they strike, you know, they eventually take over Judah. And the people of God are left nationless. And he's saying, in the midst of you losing all of your possessions, And your identity, even in that, in verse 18, we read, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. The end of verse 19 is, He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. The only time uh, the conjunction of feet like deer's and high places are used is when David is singing his praises to God about how he's removed him from the affliction of Saul, how he's delivered him from his adversaries and his enemies. These are times when the people of Israel are going to be going through really, really tough times. It was fitting for them then, and it's fitting for us now. We might not be losing our nation, but we're going through things that often make us doubt the existence of a God. We might not have the extreme measures of having lost loved ones, We're going through things where we're losing certain things that we feel like are very essential to us. And we're asking, how am I going to survive? You know, how how will I cope through these things? how, How can I have a positive attitude towards these things and still sing praises to my God? The only way that's possible is, is if we truly understand the gospel is not circumstantial. The gospel is embedded in the promise that is not circumstantial in our surrounding environments. Horatio Spofford is a famous hymn writer who wrote one of my favorite hymns, It Is Well. And, you know, context always enriches content. So I'm going to give a little context of how that hymn was written. Uh, during, during the late 1800s, the great Chicago fire took the, took the Spofford's family's two-year-old son from them. And upon facing this tragedy, Spofford and his wife, he, uh, they agreed upon going to Europe and taking their family to Europe for a little time, crossing the Atlantic. Um, but Fa- Spofford had some last-minute business that he had to take care of, so he sent his family first. But on that trip, or after that trip, he receives a letter from his wife where she says, saved alone, because they lost their four daughters to shipwreck. And it's during these times when Spofford is traveling to his wife, he's thinking, how can I encourage her? How can I bring her joy, hope in the midst of this sorrow? And that's when he writes, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow is like sea billows roll, sorrow is like losing our five children, sorrow is like it happening twice, sorrow is like it happening five to five different kids that we had. And when sorrow is like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well It is well with my soul. He was finding joy in the God of his salvation because his gospel was not circumstantial. It wasn't dependent upon how God was blessing him in the here and now. Because what he actually writes, the third verse, 
Is my sin or the bliss of this glorious thought? My sin not in part, but the whole. Was nailed to the cross, I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. This is a joy and the hope that he wanted to bring to his wife after they had lost their children. And this is a joy that keeps us, sustains us, propels us to believe in the God in the midst of all of this evil in this world. It's the only thing worth keeping on, holding on to and holding fast to because Jesus is the only thing, the only person that will always hold fast to you. And the question we have is in the midst of the reality of this life and the reality of our faith, how, how deep are we digging to believe in this God, to trust in this God? And I believe that those roots should be deep because Jesus plants himself that deeply in, into our mess that deeply into the thick and the mess of everything, all the sin that we're crowded with because he came to die for us. Third point, which leads us to our root in Jesus, is talking about that very thing, why it is essential, why it is trustworthy, why he is trustworthy, and uh, why it's essential for us to view him like that because his roots are so deeply invested in us. Uh, I remember the first time, first time I watched Braveheart, and uh, Braveheart's every man's favorite movie, right? I, I watched Braveheart, and it, there's never a good reaction from Braveheart, right? I, f I don't feel bad spoiling the movie because it's been 20 years, so if you haven't watched it yet, it's your fault. And <laughs> so, um, but it's nev there's never a real positive reaction from ba Braveheart. You e either get some unwarranted hero complex and you start wanting to do things and act more courageously than you actually would, which would get you into trouble. Or you just end up feeling really depressed because your favorite character in all of Hollywood history is, is dead, you know? And you know, you're thinking about uh, this character, William Wallace, and I remember, I remember exactly what I was thinking is there has to be an alternate ending, right? There has to be a different ending. You know, you, you, uh, you kind of bond yourself to this character and he's doing all these heroic acts. You know, he's the ideal, or maybe not ideal, but may, he's the ideal husband, according to how I saw the movie at that time. You know, he's the ideal leader, natural born leader. People just flock to him. And he seems like he has all the right virtues, but what happens to him? You know, eventually, tragedy comes. And now I was thinking, you know, as things seemed like they were coming to a close, like this can't be happening. This is William Wallace. He can't die. But he, sure enough, he dies. And is Israelites, along with all of us, a lot of times when we're going through our tragedies and our hardships in life, I think that's often what we're thinking. You know, there has to be an alternate ending. There has to be a different way. And if the Israelites were, sh or if the people of Judah at this time were short-sighted, uh, th they would not have seen an alternate ending. Because sure enough, in 586, they, they do lose their nation. They do lose their identity. For Christians, that's why we can't be short-sighted, can't be nearsighted. We can't look at the things that are only before us. Because if that were the case, we're really making the gospel circumstantial. Because I, I know a better hero than William Wallace. I'm sure all of us here know him too. And he builds his trust by emptying his treasures in heaven to come to be with us. He sees our mess and he wants to come in. He wants to dive in. And he's going through this life, living this perfect life. The only person who could have justly said, give me what is mine, he dispenses. And the night before his crucifixion, he's praying to his father, take this cup from me. Give me an alternate ending. Take this cup from me. I can't bear it. No answer. Because he didn't have an alternate ending. He didn't have an alternate reality. He had to bear the consequences of our sin to provide us a better way. To provide us some, a better happily ever after. For Christians who are struggling through any amounts of sin, any amounts of hardship, suffering, you have somebody that you can turn to who's gone through worse than you have. You have somebody who was unjustly pinned to the cross. 
because he saw what sin would do to you. And he said, I can't live with that. I have to die for it. And that's the Savior we turn to. And that's how we plant our roots deeply into our faith in knowing that Jesus went all in for us. He went all in to fix our wounds. He went all in to heal our divides. Jesus went all in for us. And because we know that and we believe in that, in the midst of anything fickle that is happening around us, we can have faith in this God. He's the only person we can trust in the midst of any circumstance that we are going to, going through. It's a person, Jesus Christ. You know, in our, uh, in our passage, in our verse, one verse right before, in chapter 2, verse 3, what we read is, For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. It seems slow, wait for it, it will surely come, it will not delay. You know, the beginning of this verse talks about an appointed time because that's what judgment has. Judgment of God has an appointed time because he is an exact God. Uh, There will be a very specific time, he's saying, trust me, there will be a very specific time when these Babylonians, these Chaldeans, they will suffer for their sins. And they will be punished. You can trust me about that. But the thing that gets me every single time is how, how the judgment of Jesus is so similar to the judgment of his enemies. Right? Because just like these people, Jesus had an appointed time. Throughout the Gospel of John, after each miracle, we read something interesting. Jesus was confessing, my hour has not yet come. Because there was an exact and appointed time for him to die for our sins. It was premeditated. It was planned. And he executed it to perfection. There was an appointed time. He would be nailed for our sins. And we would bear it no more. That's the gospel. It's an exact gospel. It's not something that just happens out of the blue. It was planned from the very beginning of time. We read of in Titus chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, that this is an agreement between the Trinity between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that they would agree with one another to save mankind in the midst of anything that they do. And this is what Jesus is confessing even on the cross. Because we know his statement, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But that phrase, my God, my God, that's only reserved for his covenant people because that's what he tells the Israelites in the Exodus and that's what's written for us in Revelation. I will be your God and you shall be my people. This is covenantal language, but on on the cross, Jesus was hardly treated as one who was covenantally faithful. But even in that, he's remembering the promise with his father that this death, this crucifixion will bring the forgiveness of many people. And this will sustain us and bring us faith and allow us to believe in the midst of anything that is happening because he's taking care of the worst of things. You know, we, we mentioned two woes earlier in chapter 2. And we, those two woes could easily be understood in the opposite of what Jesus had to incur. In chapter 2, verse 6, we read, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. For Jesus, it is, not, is it not woe to him who gives up what is only rightly his? In chapter 2, verse 9, we read, Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to set his nest on high. But in Luke 9, we read Jesus saying, the foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of God does not have a place to lay his head. He became nestless for us. He went from the highest places and reached down to the lowest in order to reach the people that he had to save. Friends, that's my, uh, that's what I get from Habakkuk. You know, it might not be the most encouraging thing in the world because it talks about a lot of circumstantial tragedies. And tragedies are never the same, right? Some people suffer through more than other people. And often we think about how unjust that is. You know, how unjust it is that certain people have to go through more trials, tribulations, forms of illness, You know, there's different issues that uh, people have to deal with together as family. Maybe within friends or maybe an outcasting incident. You know, there are different amounts of suffering in this world. But all of us do suffer to a certain extent. 
We can't tell each other, I understand exactly what you're going through. But we can tell one another, he knows exactly what you're going through. You're suffering through un- injustice. This guy was the most unjustly punished person in the history of the universe. He had no business being there on the cross, but he was there for you and me. You're suffering from the effects of sin. He chose to enter in to feel that, even though he didn't have to. We can turn to our Savior because he treaded our waters. He knows exactly what we're we're going through, and he knows a solution to it. And he's saying, come to me. Come to me, you who are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Put your burdens on me. Put your burdens on my shoulders. And remember that my shoulders caved in on the cross for you. Our Savior's heart is for us. If we were to only say, I need you, I believe in you, in the midst of everything that's happening, you are better than Jesus. You are enough. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for giving us this gospel. We thank you that Jesus truly is enough for us and he is sufficient for all of our needs because it overrides any of the struggles, any of the sins, any of the sufferings that we have if we were to call him our savior, our redeemer. We praise you, Heavenly Father, for putting this plan into motion and Jesus for executing it so perfectly in a way where it not only makes sense for us, but you give us a spirit to help us and alleviate us in times of doubts, to direct us back to the cross, to the resurrection, to know that we are justified, righteous before you. So help us to live with this faith. Help us to believe in it more and more each day we have because Lord, we pray that walking with you and walking alongside you would be the greatest joy that we have in this life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.